Hello, hello, everybody. So many familiar faces. Hello, Paul. Hello, Michael. Hi, Steve and Roseanne. Jeff and Peggy, wonderful to see so many of you. Very warm welcome. Um, we're going to get started now. And um, many of you already know me. I'm Birdfoot's artistic director, Jenna Sherry. Um, and such a warm welcome to what is the very last, unbelievably, event in Birdfoot's 10th season. Um, it's hard, it's quite amazing to think back 10 years ago and remember um, the first concerts in New Orleans and the venues where we played and meeting the audiences and sort of coming up with this idea of a sort of a chamber music festival with a New Orleans flavor. And now here we are 10 years with much more of an idea of what that means and reinventing it yet again online. Um, today we are exploring Brahms's horn trio and the subject of memory. Um, there are so many facets to this theme of memory in music, um, how music unfolds in time and how layers of memory and symbolism contribute uh, to this final tapestry of how we understand and hear music. Um, for those of you who are new to Birdfoot Backstage, this is an event in which we take apart and then put back together a piece of music. So there will be a performance at the entire piece at the end, but we'll do quite a lot of talking about it and some demonstrating in the meantime. And before I introduce my wonderful colleagues, Shuan Chai and Tunis van der Svart, um, I'd like to first thank all of Birdfoot's sponsors, program advertisers, and all of you, so many of you in the audience who have made 10 years of Birdfoot Festival possible. I'd especially like to thank the Selly Foundation and the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival Foundation for this support, their support of this season. I'd also like to recognize the incredible hard work of the entire Birdfoot team, especially Tracy Sherry, Birdfoot's executive director, Gianna Sachere, and Birdfoot's board members. If you're joining us today from somewhere outside New Orleans, um, I invite you and encourage you to rename yourself. Um, you can find, uh, if you hold your mouse above your own photo, you can find three little dots. And if you click on that, you'll find the option to rename yourself and tell us both your name and your location, where you're joining us from. It's really fun for us to see um, who's joining from where. Um, wonderful. Uh, some of you may also have noticed that tonight's event is now by, sorry, not tonight's, today's event is now by admission, uh, is now admission by donation. Um, we changed the format in the feedback that it took a little bit too long to log into these events. So we simplified it and made it much quicker to get into the event. But I would be very grateful if you would consider making a donation through Birdfoot's website as your ticket price. Um, the link is in the chat, hopefully now. Um, many people don't realize actually that 61% of all the funding that makes Birdfoot possible comes from donations, many of them small, from audience members like you. So thank you in advance. You can also find a link to Birdfoot's full season program, gorgeously designed by Michael Ball, who is here with us in the audience, also a Birdfoot board member, um, in the link. Please check it out. And if you're in New Orleans, consider supporting some of the wonderful organizations and really incredible restaurants who have advertised in the program. We're so grateful for them, to them. Many of them have donated food, um, housing, other kinds of support to Birdfoot for many of the festival's 10 years, and we couldn't have done it without them. So please go say hello uh, from Birdfoot for us. Um, and lastly, we have so much enjoyed hearing your reactions and thoughts to previous Birdfoot events. Um, so please uh, send us your reactions to tonight. Don't be a stranger. We'd love to hear from you what you liked, um, what you loved, what we should continue from this season into the next season. And if you miss some of the earlier events, you can find all of them and either watch or, or rewatch them on Birdfoot's website and YouTube channel. And now the most important part, um, introducing these wonderful colleagues who have joined me tonight. Um, thank you, Shuan and Tonis, so much for taking part in this and joining us. Um, there's so much I could say about both of them, both Shuan and Tonis perform internationally. Um, 
stages all around the world and have multiple wonderful, very inspiring recordings. But I will leave it for you to read in their bios on Birdfoot's website or in the program. And to introduce you, I wanted to ask both of you um, a slightly surprise question. Uh, if you were not a musician, what would you do? Shuan, do you want to answer first? Sure. Um, I guess if I were not a musician, I would, um, I would probably write children's books is, um, is my feeling. And this comes from putting my daughter to bed. She's now seven and she's asked for a story basically every day of her life. <laughs> and sometimes if she's not tired yet, then that turns into two stories or three. And so I realized, <clears throat> I guess a couple of years ago when she was about four or five, that, um, that I've now fully invented thousands of stories. Um, and my husband happens to be a, 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 um, really good at drawing and sketching and doodling. And we always thought that, you know, if we had time that we should sit down and commit these to paper, but I think you should make that a reality someday. Wonderful. Tennis, how about you? Well, I'm, I'm not sure, but I would certainly do something outdoors because I just love being out in nature. And uh, so I would work in the woods, probably do something or, or maybe a nature guide, something like that. And I'm, I'm very happy, very lucky that the horn is actually an outdoor instrument. So I sometimes can go with the horn in the woods and practice there. And that always makes me really happy. So that kind of combination. That actually seems like such a lovely connection to tonight's program, as we'll, as we'll get to soon. Um, but maybe now I'll just say a few words before we jump into the music. Let me just say a few words more about this topic. As I was sort of thinking to, you know, the way we listen to music, um, music really unfolds in time. So if you, every time what we hear in the present moment, what you're hearing me say now, you might hear differently or understand differently, um, maybe because of how I introduced myself at the beginning of the program, or maybe because you know me outside this event when I'm not dressed up and you know that I can be really incredibly silly sometimes. And so therefore you sort of hear what I'm saying now with that memory and that history as context. And perhaps also what I'm saying to you right now might set up an expectation for you of what might come later in, in this exploration. And so music in the same way, what you hear at every moment is somewhat filtered by what you've just heard and what you think you might heard hear next, and also perhaps what you heard last time you heard this piece of music, if it's a piece you you really love, that maybe the first time you heard it, if you've played it, maybe when you played it, or perhaps even what you've done today and whatever sort of state or energy you're coming to this with. So there's always this element of unfolding in time. Um, and there's also an interesting element of music that there's often a sense of something we hear often at the beginning of a piece of music coming back. Think, for example, of a chorus in a song um, or, or a stanza that returns in a poem as a chorus. And when something comes multiple times, there can both be a wonderful sense of familiarity, feel of, oh, I've heard this before, or oh, the part I really love, perhaps in a song, something you can sing along to or hum along to, um, a feeling of homecoming maybe, or there can also, if, if the sort of the narrative or the story or the same thing happens in poetry has changed and added information, there can even be a sort of sense of sadness or, or of this repetition taking on another shade of meaning. So in other words, we're, everything we hear has to do with this memory and this relationship of what we heard before. This feels to me very appropriate for Brahms because Brahms both loved and studied so-called old music um, because you have to remember in Brahms's time, the music that you would hear in a concert hall would probably have been just written, possibly even finished days before, probably for that specific concert or maybe those performers. So this concept of of, um, of a sort of repertoire of music or classical music that we have today really didn't exist to the same extent then. But Brahms nonetheless loved going back and studying the music of Bach, the music of other uh, Baroque and Renaissance composers and, and brought this element in subtle ways into how he wrote. But Brahms music also feels 
like it often is sort of longing for um, a sort of lost path, a lost past or sort of recollecting. So this topic of memory um, feels quite appropriate for Brahms. And anyway, we'll get into all of this, plus the way that another facet of memory might be in a way even the instruments we're playing on today. But let's get started with a little bit of the music. I'm going to share you a little bit of the Brahms trio, and then we'll jump in and talk about it. So here's about uh, a minute, a minute and a half or two minutes of music. Okay, we're going to leave you hanging there, but don't worry, you'll get to hear it, hear it all again. Um, 
So we just got to the point of the music where it returns, but now I want to go back and, and test your memory about how we started. So the very first thing the violin plays is this. And in music, we call this interval a fifth. And it's actually exactly across the violin strings. It's the same interval, actually, as the violin strings are tuned in. Um, it's, and it's a very basic building block of music, very open. But the fifth also has makes me think of something else. It makes me think of this. And, and before I go on, I want to remind all of you, um, if you have questions, comments, anything else, um, please feel free to put them in the chat as we go and we'll work them in and answer them, some of them as we go. So I'm curious if you, all of you there who have your, your chats ready, I'd love to know what you associate with this pattern. So what does that remind you of? What does that, what comes to mind when you hear that? Feel free to type things in. And while we're doing this, I'm gonna turn it charge, yes. <laughs> First reaction is charge, absolutely. Um, fox hunting, you're you're all right on it. And this is the perfect moment to turn it over to Tonis and ask him if you can say why. Why does this remind us of charge and fox hunting? And can you tell us a bit about Brahms and this idea of the Waldhorn? Of course, yes, yes. As you as as you might have noticed, as you might have seen, I'm playing an old-fashioned type of horn in the in the video because um, it has no valves yet the the music doesn't need valves yet but that's because Brahms was kind of old-fashioned about uh, his instrumentation um, the horn that I play is this one it's a beautiful thing actually it has a nice painting in the bell not so uncommon but still I think it's really pretty and I, I very much um, cherish this instrument and it's a it's a direct um, descendant of the hunting horn, and that's why Jenna pointed out this this kind of uh, call that param param could could um, could come from a from a hunting horn player, and um, yeah, the hunting horn has been around in um, in Europe for hundreds of years. Of course, comes from the from the animal horn, that's what it all started with as a signal instrument. And then it uh, became the hunting horn, the, the brass hunting horn, and then evolved into, well, this kind of instrument. And I think it was around 1700 when the horn was for the first time invited into the orchestra, invited into the, well, let's say the culture orchestra. And then the, the role of the horn was very, very clear, very uh, clearly defined in the beginning, in the 1700s. It was always a hunting scene they had to play. So they played some, some hunting calls, either backstage or on the stage. That was their role. And then slowly they became uh, part, of the, uh, part of the orchestra. And it, the hunting horn is played like this. <laughs> In order to be as loud as possible, of course, the, the message had to be transported over, over um, huge distances. And you can imagine that in a small Baroque orchestra, this was a very brutal sound. So I think people relatively uh, quickly started to adapt the instrument and started to using the hand inside the bell as kind of a mute to make the horn sound much more mellow. <laughs> And I don't know if you can hear this over this this connection, but to me this sounds much more mellow and milder and softer than the hunting horn. So a, a, a different sound, but still, the idiom of the of the natural horn is of course the same as the hunting horn. And Brahms knew this. Brahms was a horn player himself. He learned to play the horn in his youth, and he loved it. He loved this. Uh, maybe also because of the connection of this instrument and the hunt, so the outdoors, as I, as I told you before, um, was very dear to him. He was a walker. He loved to be out. And uh, he must have heard horns playing in the fields and in the woods. So, and plus the fact that he learned to play the horn himself, the natural horn, the hunting horn. So in spite of the fact that in 1815, 
the valves were invented so the horn was also um, well maybe not improved but the horn evolved into a, a different kind of instrument with valves like a trumpet with more possibilities but also with some disadvantages and Brahms just very much disliked that that new invention he thought that um, the horn lost its natural beauty because of the valves because it, it became in his ears it became a bit more like a like a machine and that's why can in I 18... can i ask you just a moment can i jump in and ask you just a little bit more about that i found it what would you say the advantages are? I think it's really easy to have this idea of, oh, an instrument evolves, it must be getting better. But what would you say the advantages, at least as far as Brahms see them, or as you would, to the, the sort of the, the valve list, this model that you play? Well, I, I think you gain something, you lose something. And uh, the, 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 it's, I think the best way to approach this question is to look, what, to look at the reason why valves were invented. The horn has has limited possibilities. That's for sure. You can, without doing uh, special things, you can play. So it's like like uh, using a limited number of keys on the piano. There are notes in between that you cannot use. So that. And, that, and can that Explain why why that is, and and perhaps what that has to do with this fifth that we associate so much with the horn. Um, ooh, that's that is. Uh, I'm not sure if I can explain this very clearly because <laughs> that's that's not really my profession. <laughs> that because it's it's um, that's given by nature. It's like like when you when you um, sound a string on the violin and you divide it uh, in the middle, then it becomes... Okay, maybe you can demonstrate it. I can even show that the, the, the bottom string sounds like this if it vibrates the whole length, and if I stop it in the middle, it sounds twice as high an octave up. And if I divide it then in thirds, we get, in fact, the same notes that the, that the horn can play yeah. if I divide the violin string like that. And it has to do with the natural thing that uh, that in um, in the horn there is a um, a standing wave when you when you make the um, when you make the, the the air vibrate. There's a standing wave inside the horn, and by um, by changing the tension of the lips, one can kind of break the wave in two. So you get the the octave higher, and then you can break that octave again in two, and you get the fifth and and again and, and and so on. I can I can try to demonstrate that. This is this is uh, by the way already the octave, the very lowest note I cannot play. That is, I I don't think anyone can do that. I've never heard a horn player play that really low note. But we know from from science that somehow it's there. So this is the octave, and now I'm going to to. Um, Put a bit more tension in the lips to get the next note, and that will then be the half of the octave, the fifth. So the distances are getting smaller and smaller the higher I go. Like like on the violin, when you when you um, divide the string into smaller and smaller portions. That is the same principle. But there's still notes lacking in between that you can play on the violin and on the piano, but not on this instrument, uh, without using an extended technique. And that's what people learned in the 18th century, to use, make use of the, the hand. I explained the hand in the, in the beginning was like a mute, and then people found out that this hand could also manipul manipulate the, the pitch of the horn. So by closing the bell or opening the bell, one can manipulate the pitch. I can I can easily demonstrate that. Maybe I should stand up. Yeah. So this is how I normally play. Harmonic series. And each of these notes I can lip down and with the help of the hand I can can go a semitone lower like this. And, and 
this this technique uh, one one can um, one can use over the whole register and also uh, yeah, create more notes just by manip manipulating sounds and like this in the end one can play uh, chromatically on the natural horn using all the different notes all the notes in between the harmonic series but as you can hear the all the sounds are a little different so yeah you, you, you get an um, a palette of of colors of sound colors which i think and we know from sources in the from the 18th century that people love this people thought this was very exceptional for this instrument to have all these color possibilities so the and and then when the valve was invented people still kept cherishing this kind of sound people still wanted to hear this kind of sound and there were actually the the valve horn was somehow like a like a different type of instrument. It was not the next thing after the natural horn. And people like Brahms still kept listening to the natural horn and still kept uh, composing for the natural horn. So the, the valves were invented in 1815 and Brahms wrote his horn trio in 1865. And we know from letters that he wrote to Clara Schumann, for instance, that he really preferred the horn player to play on this type of instrument because of these awkward sounds because of the well the, the emotion behind the stop notes the use of the different colors wow thank you so much tonis for that for that demonstration um and it's also a beautiful idea this idea that that what you just called these awkward notes that part that the elements of beauty has to do also with this texture and almost imperfection that, that goes into the expression um so the other, I want to now s s segue on to, um, as well as a hunting horn, I also understand that the horn was also used um, in association with delivery of the mail and the, the sort of the post. Um, and I wonder, um, these were obviously a slightly different calls. And I wondered if I could, I just wanted to, to very quickly share a wonderful document um, I found from uh, not a German, but a book from England from 1888. So just a little bit after, a few, 20 years after Brahm wrote this. Can you all see this? And it's called Coach Horn Calls. It's all about coach horn. So it's sort of similar. It turns out the coach horn and the post horn are actually a little, a little bit different, but we can get into that another time. And so this is a sort of a little bit of a guidebook called What to Blow and How to Blow It of what you play when you start to clear the road. Um, if you slow down, slack and pace. So, the, so there was a sort of a communication between maybe the drivers of the horse and the person with the horn. I'm not sure exactly how this worked. Um, and pulling up, which is, I think was, a, which was arriving in a town. So basically this would be announcement of, hey, we've arrived. And it was really important to make this announcement clear so people would come and get their messages because then the coach needed to go on to keep the pace. So fascinating how this often came in. Shuan, can you? Talk about this more, a little bit more in, in classical romantic music. Oh, you're muted. Actually, would you mind putting that back up? Because I was thinking I, I'd like to play a couple of these so that people can hear the difference between a couple of these little things. Okay, so you have this, um, you know, clearing the road thing. Um, <laughs> And then you have um, to uh, pull up. You know, so all of these, um, I find that fascinating. I think this is wonderful that, um, yeah, that, that people, people knew um, based on what they were hearing, um, what they needed to do in order to get their post. Um, so this brings us to actually this, um, a song from Schubert's Winterreise. Um, it's a song cycle that he wrote in um, 1827, 1828. Um, and this is um, a set of 24 songs that about, well, Winterreise uh, literally translates to a winter's journey. And um, it's a journey of, of, a, of a man who's been spurned in love. Unfortunately, he arrived at a town uh, probably in the springtime and courted a young lady um, who he thought uh, he loved and who thought he thought loved him in return. 
and he expected to marry her and ask for her hand, but uh, she and her family made arrangements for uh, for her to marry someone um, wealthier. And so a lot of the, these 24 songs are about him just ruminating on his misfortune um, and his broken heart. Um, but halfway through the cycle, number 13, is a song called De Post, The Mail. And, um, and I think Jenna has, uh, has, a, has an audio file that we can hear the first, the first verse of what this sounds like. Yes, and and especially in, in extra specially, this is actually a rec um, something that Shuan recently recorded with a baritone, so it has a a, a personal touch. Von der Straße her ein Postkorn klingt. Was hat es, dass es so verspringt, mein Herz? Was hat es, dass es so verspringt, mein Herz, mein Herz? Die Post bringt einen Brief für dich, was trägt. Okay, we're gonna okay. we're gonna stop it stop it there. Shuan, do you want to tell us what the the text we heard so far says? Yeah, um, it's uh, the post horn sounds from the street. What is it that makes you leap so, my heart? The post comes from the town where I once had a beloved, my heart but the post brings no letter for you. Um, and so these, uh, these large jumps that you hear, um, the, the singer singing always, mein Herz, mein Herz, you know. Um, so it's uh, reminiscent of, uh, you know, or, or yeah, reminiscent of this, of this post, uh, post horn call. Mm -hmm. um, and it's slightly, uh, I mean, it's a kind of happy sounding song but it's a, a little bit desperate that he's, he's still kind of hoping that, that, you know, maybe there was some mistake and maybe she's actually going to write to me or maybe she's just going to, you know, um, something like this. Um, but, uh, and, and he, at, at the end, the, the whole song just kind of fades away to, um, you know, there's just absolutely nothing. And the post, the uh, post carriage is just, ridden away and, and and he's left with nothing um, and I just wanted to, to say that um, a lot of the the background sounds that you heard in that clip uh, was because this is a, um, part of a, a video recording where the um, the singer was actually uh, taking bits of paper that he was hoping were were post for him and, and he was um, crumbling them up and and throwing them at the camera actually <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's a it's a project that's actually premiering tomorrow. It's it's it goes live tomorrow. Fantastic. So, uh, Would you yeah. perhaps mind um, preparing at the end? Maybe you could share a link for that, and we could share it with the people who are here tonight. Um, um, I'll see if, if I can find one. Yeah, if sure. You can find it. If sure. not, we can. Yeah. Um, wow. No, thank you for that, Shuan, and that wonderful recording. It's funny here. I, I, I suddenly thought actually you might be rustling a page, and I didn't realize it was in the, in the sound. The other thing that struck me about hearing this song, and I think there's a, a really direct parallel with Brahms here, is in addition to this post horn sound of announcement and excitement, um, this yup up up beep up 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 bum 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 it feels to me like that we can really hear the horses. You get that rhythmic feeling of galloping also built into the music. So there's this sort of the two layers, the horn and the horses. Um, and this kind of takes us actually into the last movement of the Brahms, perhaps. Tunis, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so thank you, thank you, Sean, for sharing this recording. It's a wonderful. What we should realize the horn has always been a signal instrument in in many cultures. I, I possess, for instance, a, a wooden horn from Norway called Lur. It's a one piece horn. It's a straight horn made of birch wood. A beautiful instrument used by by peasants in Norway in the past, and maybe they still do, to uh, to be in touch with each other. 
if, if help was needed, for instance. So talking about memories, this, of course, hearing a signal, a certain signal brings, brings a memory. And I think the, the last movement of the Brahms horn trio is very, I would say, opens with very typical horn music. This is the kind of uh, almost gallop horn stuff that also Mozart wrote in his horn concertos, this very typical thing. <laughs> That's almost comes natural on the horn. So and that, that gives, uh, I think, wonderful material. And then, of course, it's Brahms. So he starts playing with his material and, and turns into in, it into something really exciting for the three instruments. And the wonderful, I, maybe sometimes um, I think it's, it's an impossible combination, these three instruments. But in the hands of a composer like Brahms, it works. It works like, like a miracle. And interestingly, also, Shuan, I wonder if you um, might show us what Brahms is doing in the piano part while that melody Tunis was playing, because I think we hear the horses here again. Wonderful, thank you. And even I can almost sort of imagine, you know, maybe the horse's hooves hitting a rock sort of unevenly. So some of them sound louder than others. And you also even get a feeling of the texture of the road. So there's so much in this simple music. Um, I mean, not so simple music, but in a way, simple, simple horn call, so many layers of meaning. I'm seeing some wonderful questions um, in the, the, the chat. And I just wanted to tell you that we will come to these a little they connect to some topics we're going to get to presently so we'll come to them shortly so before we get to back to the first movement because um i realize we're teasing you here with the with the fourth movement the another interesting thing about this fourth movement of the trio um which actually relates to to memory now that i think about it is that brahms actually shamelessly borrowed this from a folk song um I so and it, which which kind of went something like this. The folk song goes. So you can hear. Oops, I think I need to. Sorry, I need to. I'll do that one more time with a better sound. Mm, which sounds really exactly the same as. Just with a few extra notes added on. And it turns out that the, the text of this song um, is quite a sort of light-hearted, um, cheeky. Uh, it goes, no one should have anything to do with love. It has brought many a fine lad to kill himself. Today, my buxom wench withdrew her love. I accused her. I accused her. Um, the, the German translation, the, the German version is even better and, and more rhythmic, but you, you get the point. Um, and I wonder, Tönis, it, what, what this means to you, the fact that even a folk song is in fact using this horn-like tune. How, how do, would you sort of understand that in this kind of a, a context? I think it's, it's all very connected. The horn is, is a simple instrument. It's, a, it's almost a folk instrument. So it, it, it belonged to the people, you know, it, it was part of people's daily lives with the, the post carriage arriving, with, uh, with hunters uh, going through the village, peep the sounds people, people heard in the, in, in, in the woods, and even their own, their own children playing these instruments. It, it's all very connected. It's, it's all part of the, the natural environment, I would say. So no wonder it ended up, it ended up in the music. And I wonder just before we go back to the, the first movement, could you demonstrate this wonderful passage where we sort of get back to this large leaping interval that we started at the very beginning when we were talking about the fifth? Would you demonstrate this passage from the fourth music, the fourth movement? I think you, I think you mean this one. Is that what you meant? Exactly. Thanks. Playing with just it, making it really expressive. This simple, simple um, um, motive. And it feels like, in a way, finally, in the fourth movement. I mean, the fourth movement of this of this horn trio is so almost literally based on what the horn does best. 
So then it seems to me when we go back to the first movement, which we started with, now this gesture from the very beginning, especially because it's played by the violin, not the horn, even feels like a sort of a memory in itself. So we sort of start with the memory of the horn maybe even perhaps a memory of horn music or an idea that's sort of not fully formed yet. And then by the end of the trio, the fourth movement, and I apologize, you're not going to get to hear it today. Um, then we sort of get the more literal picture. Um, does that, does that resonate with, with you, Shuan? And can you also talk to us about how Brahms came up with this theme? Oh, sure. Sure. Um, yeah. I think, I think um, the popular, popular lore is that, is that um, Brahms came uh, came up with this um, this theme when he was on a walk on one of his many walks, um, and Brahms had a habit of composing during his summer vacation um, because he was often during the rest of the season during the what we would call the academic calendar. Um, he was very busy um, in town. Uh, with his own performances, and um, and so he left the summers to wander in the forest and wander in the hills, and uh, and was usually very very prolific, um, and composed a lot of uh, chamber music, um, and this trio was one of those one of those pieces. Um, actually, um, Jenna, you had mentioned that uh, that his first biographer Dietrich. Um, had uh, had written a little anecdote um, about this about this very piece actually when Brahms says um, I was I was walking along one morning and as I came to this spot the sun shone out and the subject immediately came into my head and I thought it was interesting the way he said you know that it came into his head as as if though it was something that maybe he heard before um, or yeah something that uh, it was part of a, an act of reminiscence. Um, but he's not obviously not the only composer who's ever, um, you know, gone out and been inspired by nature. Um, there are many great masterpieces, such as Beethoven's Appassionata, piano sonata, um, was also composed um, when Beethoven was ruminating and uh, you know walking alongside a, a river. This time it was, you know, and the uh, supposedly the rush of the river um, that that inspired him to to. Uh, his. <laughs> You know all of these kinds of um, you know this this action and um, and the the kind of burbling sound in in the piano um, so yeah taking inspiration from from nature is a yeah seemed like a pretty common thing no you can you can you could really hear that turbulence of the water in in what you played and and it seems to me actually that even the very way that this music is composed you know this theme that came from came to Brahms while walking in the woods has a sort of wandering feeling. Um, you know, when, when I play it, it feels like, you know, the, the violin kind of pokes around, uh, around F, you know, it, after, after this initial fifth, this sort of memory of the horn. Uh, whoops, let me put my, turn my sound back on. So after this initial memory, uh, is he sort of pokes around the F and the, oh, maybe not, not below the scope. Above it, uh, maybe, and then he sort of finds this note C and then tries here, maybe again, and then finally finds his way back to, back to the F, and of course, to go back to what I was talking to at the beginning about the way we sort of listen to music also in retrospect, this F that the melody ends on was already in our ear from this beginning. So I'll play it sort of for you without the commentary so you can so you can hear that and also sort of hear whether what it feels like to come back to that F for the second time a few bars later. <laughs> There's something very open-ended about that, um, but also this yum da da dim ba ba bum rhythm that stays through it the entire time. Also, to me, has a feeling of not quite 
walking steadily, but sort of walking and looking at the scenery and walking and thinking and sort of getting lost in your own thoughts somehow. Can you talk, Shuan, about what the, the piano does at the same time that gives it an even more of a sort of wandering, almost lost in thought feeling? Sure. Um, yeah, the piano part, it's, uh, it's actually really interesting. I think it's the only piece that I know uh, where the piano doesn't have a downbeat um, for uh, a, a clear, um, how many bars is this? Sorry, I have 46 measures. A lot. Uh, so the, the first the first 46 measures, um, yeah, the, the piano doesn't doesn't really play a downbeat. So um, yeah, so what that basically means is that um, the piano accompaniment to what to what Jenna's just been playing. So she plays and then what I have under it is It's always on the second beat, and it gives it a, a slightly uneven feeling. Um, yeah, because you expect. Which maybe a lesser composer would have done, but she about would have Brahms. Seen. That's so wonderful to hear. Could you play it one more time, the real version? Could you actually play for us one more time the on the beat version maybe and put your original sound on just to make it a little clearer? If you could play us the on the beat version and then the off the beat version so we can hear them next to each other. Sure, this is the, um, this is the on the beat version. This is the, um, yeah, the discarded draft version. And this is what Brahms actually wrote. Thank you. And interestingly enough, I mean, I, I maybe now is the time to admit that I had heard this piece before I played it myself. And actually the first time I played it, I went, wait, what? That's where the first beat is? <laughs> because I, had, I, I hadn't actually heard it. So there's this ambiguity, almost a floating. We don't quite know where we are rhythmically. And also harmonically, um, the way the, the harmonies, Shuan, can you show us what happens over sort of the first eight bars? Because there was a great question in the chat a little early. Um, from from Stuart about sort of sort of pointing out that the melody is not quite as simple as it sounds when I play it alone um, because as, as as you pointed out Stuart the the sort of it's controlled by the dominant and for those of you who 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 don't know what that is there's sort of two really important chords in music uh, which you might know as five and one otherwise known as tonic and dominant and the the dominant always leaves us with this feeling of needing to come home to the dominant and that's usually where we feel ah okay now we can end we can take a breath or, or we can sort of put a dot at the end of that sentence um, and how you really know when you get to the end of the piece and Brahms starts sort of keeping us up in the air we don't with the dominant maybe you could show us Shu on these first few measures does here is that he um, right away convinces you that the dominant is actually the tonic that he's you know that this is at the end of these eight bars you could be convinced that the piece is in B flat major you know instead of an E flat major so um, and then he goes on and yeah I, I think I think that's a, a very fair um, assumption for for a listener to make, you know. So once again, it's the the apps, uh, the, you know, the the opposite of of what a compu uh, a composer would usually want their audience to think. And the other thing that this does is is when he goes then back to that to that 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 
B flat chord at the end, it actually has this sort of feeling we associate with what's called a plagal uh, cadence with what, what you know is that sort of amen feeling. Could you show us those, those chords, Shuan? Which again is a much sort of softer way to end this this phrase, and that's exactly where I leave you with the F, and then Tunis comes in to to play the horn on its to play this melody on its real instrument. And the one other thing I wondered if you could show us, Chuan, is is these first four chords you play are actually different flavors of that of the exact same notes on the piano. And I wonder if you could just play those for us so you can. So know that these are all the same notes, but in different arrangements and hear what a sort of different color they give to the music. Wonderful. And there's also even something about that that sort of ties into this idea of memory, like, was it like this? Or maybe it was like this, sort of almost rolling something um, around. Um, anyway, Tonis, can I pass it over to you to show us a bit of um, how this, the, the stop and the notes on the horn that you showed us earlier, how this comes into um, some, something Brahms actually wrote, sort of a melodic line. Yes, of course, there is this, this wonderful passage a little a little further in the first movement where I think uh, Brahms uses the, the natural horn to emphasize the feeling of maybe feeling of grief. Like this. So the, each second note has this tension has this and that goes very well with the chords actually it's a pity we cannot play together now but you will hear that later in the in the recording because this 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 almost harsh sound i think um underlines the the the, the, the tension of the chords there so it's very very clever use of the instrument here and that's something you never get on a on a modern horn with the valves because they are meant to 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 sound equal There I am muted and playing it. I it also had the feeling to me that that I should change my sound to sort of bring out this squeeze. Um, and that was a, a wonderful thing. Maybe this is a really good time to bring in the question from from Ella in the chat uh, asking what adjustments should um, a, a sort of a player on a valve horn make to try to get as close as possible to to the to the sound that Brahms had in mind. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I think every horn player should play a little bit of natural horn just to get the experience to get into this different sound world, because that will really influence your uh, your valve horn playing and it will also make you a much more secure player on the on the valve horn because valve horn is much, much easier than this one actually You're really vulnerable on this one all the time. So it will really guide you to um, to play like a singer. A singer who has to find his or her notes from from what would from what he hears around him, and um, so make make these connections. If you start to play like that, I think that's that's a very um, uh, fruitful way to to go. And um, but apart from that, if you play this on this piece on the on the valve horn, I think two things are really important. One is that you uh, should learn to play soft. The natural horn was basically a soft instrument. Mm. If we if we read uh, comments from end of the 18th century, Gerber, for instance, wrote when he heard two uh, really good horn players playing together, they sounded like a flute accompanied by a viola da gamba. Mm. Two very soft instruments. And that's so different from the idea that we normally have today of the horn as a very, oh, well, an, a, an instrument that can play really loud and often does. At the same time, of course, there are moments where the horn should play loud in this piece, because it's and and then I think of the connection with the hunting horn, as as we discussed before. That's that's always there in in horn music. This this memory, this this thing of the past. So that's one thing. Learn to play really soft, 
mm. and that makes it much easier to blend with the with the violin and the piano. And the second thing is that of course I think it's it's not forbidden on the valve horn to sometimes play stop notes. There is this wonderful wonderful uh, example I think in the, the end of the slow movement. We know Brahms wrote the piece kind of in memory of his of his mother. It was the first piece he wrote after his mother died. He was very fond of his mother. He couldn't compose for a while. Then he wrote this piece and especially the slow movement is, is well, a, a movement full of grief. And then at the very end of the piece, um, four bars before the end, he, he writes this for the horn. <laughs> I think the first bam is very um, is, is is almost angry and full of sorrow and um, so you can do that on the on, on the valve horn as well you can play a stop note on that written E flat and then the very last bar when he when the same note sounds an octave lower in piano it's very covered very mellow and I think very uh, accepting and that's the kind of playing with colors that, uh, of course, you can also do on the on the modern horn, if you practice this. Wow! Thank you. I hope this helps. We're getting both a masterclass and a backstage, the real thing. Um, and Ella said that she's already bought a, a, nat uh, a natural horn, which is which is pretty cool. Um, I just wondered bef before we go on this this part you just demonstrated. Could you just play it one more time? This da ya da ya da. Because I want it to, to everyone to listen to this because this this actually comes back several times in the movement that we're going to perform for you today. Um, so maybe Tonus, you could play it one more time. <laughs> Thank you. So listen out for this, this lamenting part. And the interesting thing is sometimes it's on the violin and Tunis plays a bottom line and then sometimes it's in the horn and I play an accompanying line. And it to me, it also feels a little bit like a nagging thought or something that keeps coming back throughout the movement. So you can listen to that as we as we play it um, again. And then very last, just before the end of the movement, it comes back but it's actually split between the different instruments and we'll narrate this and point it out in the chat as we get there so you can hear it. Um, and so that somehow this is now transformed and shared um, and you can decide when you listen to it, how that affects how you hear the music and what that might mean. Um, Sean, can you talk about the other um, part that's so important in this first movement? Um, well, what we were talking about before that the um, that the piano always um, is kind of missing on the downbeat in the first beat of every bar. Um, this is a, a recurring theme uh, with the first movement. So what you'll hear in kind of the, the second theme when things really get rolling um, and the violin has the, has the melody, um, once again, the piano is going to be missing an action on the downbeat. So this is what the piano accompaniment sounds like there. So what's basically happening is he really wants to get a triplet move, uh, triplet moving. Ta da da dee da 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 tee da da dee da da. He really wants to get a triplet movement going, but it's almost like the the piano is 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 hesitant to really join in um, on the dance. And um, and even though it's it sounds like it's it's gathering momentum, it's really not until um, this material comes back at the end of the movement that he actually gives you permission, written permission. He says, um, <clears throat> actually says, un poco animato poi a poi, which means in Italian, a, a little bit, to get a little bit faster, little by little. Um, and so that he kind of gives you the permission to, to uh, open it up and to get faster. And then all of these triplets um, just kind of come crashing and tumbling in together. And then you 
have all of this, uh, all of these waves of triplets cascading together, which gives it a, a really satisfying feeling because the piano hasn't had a chance to just go ahead and and cascade. Um, you know, this whole this whole movement. It's always been held back um, by this hole um, that appears on every downbeat, where you know that when you really want to push along and and you can't. And the other thing I, I know I felt as a performer is after all of this sort of wandering in this very contemplative remembering music, it's so satisfying when you get to the end and finally you can go. <laughs> um, it's, it's really satisfying to play. I think it's just about time to, to get to the performance. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've covered a lot and, and we'll open up for all of your questions. Um, right after the 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 this this video but before i we get there i want to just um say another thank you to shuan and tunis so much for for sharing um your thoughts um and your beautiful playing and also say a special thank you to andreessen pianos in harlem um, who very kindly let us play um, on their beautiful blutner piano from um, from the 1870s so in a way even the piano <laughs> has memories and although i'm not playing on an old instrument um, my instrument is set up at the moment and i'm using a bow quite similar to one that might have been used in Brahms's time, um, which gives this added facet of historical memory. Um, so very uh, special thank you to, to Andres and Pianos. Tonis, out of, consider out of um, curiosity, when is your horn from? I can't remember if you told us already. No, sorry, I didn't tell you yet. This this is a French instrument. It's made by uh, Courtois, Neveu Anne, and it's made in between 1802 and 1805. So it's it's pretty old, yeah, and still works very well. No. Yeah. Wow. So it was made, you know, sixty plus years before before this trio was written. Fantastic, wonderful. And I'll just leave you tell you with one other thing is that um, Shu Antunis and I are going to play the whole Brahms trio. Um, and then sadly only an online per performance, um, but nonetheless a performance on June 2nd and the, the link is in the chat if you want to um, join us for that. It would be so lovely to know that there's friendly faces listening in. Um, and uh, yeah, th th then you'll get to hear the whole thing. And now I think it's time to hear the first movement of Brahms's horn trio. I will narrate a bit in the chat and Shuan and Tunis, feel free to join me if there's anything you want to point out as we listen. Enjoy, this is about 11 or 12 minutes long and then we look forward to hearing your questions.
Thank you. I see some silent um, applause there. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> not so silent applause. Um, we would love to take your questions now. You should all be able to hopefully turn on your videos. We'd love to see your faces if you want to ask them in person. Um, or if not, you can write them in the chat. Question from Paul and Kathleen, is that? Typing in the chat. No way, you have a 1940 Blutner, gorgeous. They can be very, very special instruments. Are there any um, any questions for Tunis? You've got one of the natural horn experts of the world here. Ask away. Or for Shu or for Shuan, one of the forte piano experts. Um, Shuan, can you tell us a bit um, about what you find different in terms of color and how and what it's like for you, for example, playing on this Blutner that we that we used for this video? Can you tell us about what that experience is like for you as a piano pianist and how it's different from a, a so called modern piano? Um, well, this particular uh, Blutner is um, it's not entirely straight strong. A lot of the older pianos. Um, all of the strings, um, like if you look down the length of the piano, all of the strings are completely parallel. Um, this was one of the first generations where Blutner experimented with crossing the strings over um, over themselves, and um, but not to the extent that a Steinway is really, you know, kind of completely crossed. Um, it's really only a very limited cross, um, and so you only get about uh, an octave and a half. That's um, that's that really has that um, that overlap, and what that does is that it it really has a, a really beautifully transparent sound, um, and so whenever I play and roll chords, um, you know you can you can mess around a lot with the um, with the voicing, and weigh it towards the bottom, weigh it towards the top, um, and it's really easy to get kind of a, a ping. Uh, kind of a, a almost pearly sound um, towards the the top of the piano, and what I really like on the Blutner is um, is this glorious bass sound. Um, so Paul and Kathleen in, in Oregon, um, you're probably familiar with with this um, with this characteristic on your 1940 Blutner um, as well. That it provides tremendous bass support with almost no effort. Um, it's really it's, it's a ringing bass and um, and it never covers the person that you're that you're trying to play chamber music with um, and uh, yeah so it has transparency where you need it but also a lot of power and a lot of support um, for for yeah the same exact situation you're muted sorry question from Paul <laughs> Just a statement, uh, I will never hear this piece the same again. <laughs> and realizing that it's all, the whole foundation is the, for, is the horn and, and didn't realize that Brahms was a horn player. And that just adds a whole nother dimension to how I hear it in the future. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Um, we looked for it today, but we didn't quite find it. There's actually a wonderful photo of Brahms as a boy, I think, Tunis, maybe you can describe it um, in a group of horn players. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's actually, it's it's a pity I couldn't find it. I apologize for that. It's, it's um, 35 men looking exactly like Brahms, young men with a beard. They all look like him, and there's one who looks even more like him because that's himself. And that's that's uh, they're a group of hunting horn players. Yeah, an amazing picture. And how old do you think Brahms is in that photo, roughly? Oh, hard to say. Hard to say. I think 30, 35. That's what I remember from it. Already a beard. And the belly, the Brahms belly already? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to know it. And I wanted to, to ask, um, and please, any other questions? I can't see everyone, but either raise your hand um, electronically or type it in the chat or just unmute yourself and sort of give us give us a wave and we'll try to, to pay attention. Um, 
But Tennis, I wanted to ask you um, how you got it, got started playing the natural horn. Did you start on this instrument or did you start as a valve horn player and switch? Can you tell us about how you discovered it briefly? Yes, um, I started on the on the valve horn actually. Like I, I had no idea this instrument existed when I started. And um, I, I was studying um, for a while in the south of the Netherlands, in Maastricht. And they had, um, in, in the office of the director, there was this, uh, this natural horn. And, and I was very interested. And I asked the director about the story. How did it get there? And he explained to me that this, this instrument was discovered in the city when there was um, a carnival. They had carnival, they have big carnival tradition in the south and then bands play in the streets and in one of the bands there was somebody playing on this original historical natural horn. So and then I could borrow it from the school for a while and I fell in love with the instrument. I thought this was wonderful. It's such a difference on, on, the, on the modern horn you have to push buttons and, and you learn to kind of make a connection between the note you read and the button you have to push and then most of the time not always but most of the time the right note comes out and then suddenly you have this instrument with no button at all it's it's nature is it's pure and it's it's you have to to make everything yourself and it's that's a constant um, well sometimes fight and uh, but but a constant pleasure to work with this instrument to, to listen really carefully to this instrument what it wants from you what it what it needs to to ring if if you treat it uh, badly it will be your worst enemy if you give it the right information then it will be your greatest friend so i i love this this kind of uh, being on the rope the whole time and i and um, it was so nice what you and just said about uh, the fortepiano this combination of the transparency and uh, and also the power that's in there and the, the support coming from that instrument i think that's a, for me a wonderful thing about playing early instruments is that they are so um versatile often in their sounds in the sound you can produce on the instruments the, the modern piano is a fantastic instrument. It's beautiful, of course, but it will always sound like a modern piano. It will always sound like a piano. When I play with a, with a forte piano with Chouin, sometimes I think it sounds like a guitar and sometimes it sounds like a harp. And, uh, you know, you have all this, this, this richness of colors. And that's for me, makes it much easier to connect with. And I just love this, this, uh, this diversity in music this very rich language so that's well maybe that's a little bit off topic but that's uh, what i love about early instruments and playing uh, with people like you no it, it's it's right on topic and in fact we have one more more question here from from michael ball who for those of you who don't know is the wonderful graphic designer who has designed all of birdfoot's beautiful programs and made our program which you can see at this link thank you tracy um so michael is is sort of saying that the that, that um, the performance heightened for him how the natural horn and both the violin can sort of push or bend or change the color of the notes and and Michael's asking how this might Shuan change your approach as a pianist where in a way perhaps the notes are less flexible or perhaps I, how would you respond to that well I mean the, the piano can't you know, bend pitches, obviously, but um, what you can do is play with uh, rubato um, or with timing or with pedal. Um, and sometimes, I guess, if you if you join us for the uh, for the concert on on June second, especially in the um, in the third movement, um, it's an E flat minor, which is just a, it's a very unusual key. Um, and um, as Tennis mentioned earlier. Um, in, in this program, um, full of grief and um, and really, you know, contemplative and ruminating um, and, and just very beautiful in its own way. Um, there, you're going to hear a lot of uh, rubato, a lot of pitch bending, a lot of um, sliding, uh, portato um, from the violin. And so what the piano has to do to fit in with that is then, you know, I'll break a lot of the chords, um, I'll roll them slowly, or roll them quickly to um, emphasize the top, um, or I'll uh, pedal a little bit more to get a more veiled sound. Um, that's difficult to do on a modern piano because if you if you leave the pedal on for too long, you get kind of this this um, this wash 
um, of, of piano sound, which is really inconsiderate because it basically means that no one can hear anyone else that you're playing with. Um, but on a forte piano or on an earlier instrument, um, you, you can uh, accomplish that um, still very carefully. But um, if, you, if you, again, voice towards the outside and then you can use the pedal to create this, um, I don't know, kind of a, a plush carpet um, for your colleagues to uh, walk on um, when they're when they're doing these slides and pitch bendings and, and things and that in itself is also really expressive. I think. Wow, thank you. And I love the way you described that as a plush carpet because it sort of reminds me of of certain forests where you have this sort of, you know, mossy understory and the feeling of walking on that with bare feet because I've always one of the things I've always loved about playing with gut strings on the violin is the way somehow they're much more tactile. And that's always reminded me of going barefoot. Um, mm -hmm. I did a lot as a child, another aspect of memory, perhaps my feet aren't so tough now. Um, I wanted, um, oh, there's there's one more question from Ella. Tunis, am I correct? You can play the entire piece in E flat or do you have to change? It's a very technical question. I have one more question for you, Sean, and then perhaps if there's no more burning questions, we'll start to to wrap up. Well, that's that's not a too technical question. I think there's one aspect of the natural horn. There are many more aspects, but one aspect we didn't touch upon yet, and that's the fact that the instrument actually is made of two pieces. Here it is. This is the body of the horn, and this is called the crook, and the combination make the key. And this is the E flat crook. So now it's pitched in E flat. And I can play the harmonic series of E flat plus the notes that derive from from that uh, harmonic series. And when I make I have a whole series of these crooks from very small to much bigger than this one. So, and that means that I have one crook for each um, tonality, for each key. And they all have their own specific sound. So that's another aspect that adds a lot to the diversity of the instrument, actually. And you can, well, if you listen to early music orchestras, you can maybe discover that if you, if you listen to the horns, if you look at the horns and you, you try to find out what kind of crook they have here, how long this is, and try to find out what, what it does to the sounds. Because if they have a very small crook here, it makes the instrument short and 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 um, almost trumpet-like sounding. If the crook is very big, very long, it makes the instrument um, slower and lo lower, of course, and slower and, and milder and almost trombone-like sounding. So that's another aspect of the natural horn that um, that we didn't talk about yet today, because this whole piece by Brahms is written for the E flat horn for this horn. So all the um, every time when we go off key, I have to do things, uh, sometimes um, uh, complicated things with the right hand in the bell. Good question. Wonderful. I, I wonder, do you happen to have those other crooks with you that you could just hold two or three up and show us the size or are they somewhere else? I have to admit I'm in the house of my girlfriend and I left all the crooks except for this one in my own. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should have prepared better. People would know we can, you can, you people can look up online. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to finish um, with one more. I mean, if there's any more questions from the audience, please raise your hand. Now is your moment. And if not, of course, you can email us later if you wake up in the middle of the night with a burning Brahms question. Um, but, but Shuan, I wanted to just ask you if you could, for those who who don't know, just talk briefly about this. Um, some some people may know that the piano is sort of short for pianoforte and of course we call often call historical pianos forte piano and for those of you many of you may know we we you know we associate the name piano so much with this instrument but it originally comes from the the italian words for forte being loud or strong and piano being being soft and because this was an instrument that had more dynamic um capability but this, uh, this forte piano, piano forte, it always reminds me of, of this wonderful cartoon. Unfortunately, I don't have it to show for you. We, we loved it so much that we lost it. Um, the, it was a, a, a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine that had a soap dish and dish soap sitting next to each other, having a little giggle together because their names are reversed and little soap bubbles of laughter coming up. And this always reminds me of forte piano, piano forte. Could you tell us just a little bit about maybe why the names are reversed? Well, you know, this is, um, 
I, I don't actually think that there's any real consensus about this. Um, I have, I, I, in general, I think it started out, um, you know, that the fortepiano was used to refer to um, anything that wasn't a modern piano. Um, and uh, specifically when people started making copies of Mozart's piano, his five octave piano, um, or the, the six octave piano that Schubert would have been familiar with. Um, and they, those were called forte pianos for a while, but then when they started calling, you know, a, a piano such as a Blutner that we played our Brahms on, you know, whether that was really a forte piano or not, um, I think a lot of the uh, keyboard players themselves, you know, felt that there needed to be more of a distinction um, in between these instruments, um, the early instruments and the kind of middle era instruments um, before the modern piano. But I've, I've met people who feel really strongly that, um, that, that, it, that all um, pianos should be called pianofortes because that's actually what they do. And then just be specific about what the piano does. <laughs> so if it's a five octave pianoforte or a, a six octave pianoforte. Um, but uh, I, don't, I, I don't really have a political stance either way. Um, I, I do tend to just, because I play a, a, a large variety of instruments and I'll, I'll just show you briefly what I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in front of my Steinway, um, which is a, a made, built in the late 1990s in New York. Um, it has the distinction of being signed by Herbie Hancock um, for reasons that I don't know. <laughs> um, and then this piano that I have here is um, this very, very beautiful one here. Um, let's see if I can get the fallboard open. This is um, this is a Collard and Collard um, from 1842, um, and that was actually a, a, a recent gift um, by someone who uh, who restores pianos. Um, and decided to retire and didn't have any space for it anymore. So he just kindly gave it to me. Um, and I'm, I'm in the middle of, of having it uh, further restored back to playing condition. Um, and then this one here, if you can see, um, is a forte piano from 1820. Um, it's built by Michael Rosenberger in Vienna. And the distinction of this piano is that it is only a six octave piano. It's from F to F. And it has also, I don't know if you can see there, it has six pedals. So um, the rightmost pedal is what I call the fun pedal. So um, it has a drum and a bell attached to it. Um, so maybe on some future Birdfoot edition, we can, uh, we can play the, the Turkish march or something like that um, and use it to its full potential. <laughs> That would be um, wonderful. Thank you. For, and, and just I wanted to say for, as Chuan said, it's only a six octave, meaning that that piano is actually has fewer notes than the leader piano. And we can go into this hopefully in another, a later backstage. But um, thank you so much, Chuan, for showing us those. Actually, you said that's a Rosenberger. I'm sitting next to you. You can't really see it because my violin is here next to right. a modern copy of a Rosenberger. Right. That's nice. Kind of a nice um, comparison. That's nice. You have, have both of those. Um, nice. We've already gone over, but there was just so much to, to talk about. I want to say a huge thank you to all of you who joined us tonight, and especially so many of you who have been regulars at all the backstages in this in this season. You've taken us through, what did we start with memory, and then we went on to texture, and then uh, what did we do after that? Um, voices, and then we talked about time, gratitude, and now memory, we've covered quite a lot. Um, so thank you all of you who have joined us um, for so many of these and also helped us celebrate 10 years of Birdfoot backstage because the first one was in Birdfoot's first season. And um, we're crossing fingers and toes and already starting to think about hopefully plans for Birdfoot season 11 when we can properly celebrate and toast um, and come together again in person. So for those of you who live elsewhere, you would be so warmly invited to join us in New Orleans. Um, and if you want to hear about what's happening, you can put yourself um, 
on the Birdfoot mailing list on the website. And I can promise you, we don't send out many newsletters um, because we have to write them. So you don't have to worry about getting too much mail for, from us. Um, but it would, but that way you can know when we're. Um, and then I will just say a huge thank you to you, Shuan and Tunis, and good night to everyone. See you next year.